Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Asmara Askedom, and I'm the Associate Deputy Director here at the Center for Global Security Research. Today's lecture speaker is John Bateman. He will be discussing his latest paper entitled U.S.-China Technological Decoupling, a Strategy and Policy Framework. John is a senior fellow in the Technology and International Affairs Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Prior to his current position, he served as Director for Cyber Strategy Implementation in the Office of the Secretary of Defense, and he once was a Senior Intelligence Officer at the Defense Intelligence Agency, also known as DIA. After John concludes his lecture, we'll open the floor up to questions. There are two ways you can ask a question. You can type your question into the chat, and I'll read your question out loud without mentioning any names. Please submit your questions directly to me in the chat. Uh, once again, my name is Asmret, or you can send it to everybody. The second option is to click the raised hand button, and I will call on you to ask the question. Then our host, Katie, will unmute you. While John's lecture will be recorded and posted um, online on CGSR's website, the Q&A portion will not be recorded, and Chatham House rules do apply. So you're free to use information from the Q&A session, um, but without attribution. So now, without further ado, we'll proceed. Uh, I'll turn it over to you, John, uh, to proceed with your presentation. Um, and everyone, please get ready to, to ask questions. Thank you. Okay. Okay, good. And I'm going to start sharing my screen. And uh, can I just get confirmation that you can see those slides? Right. Um, well, it's a pleasure to be with this August group uh, to talk about my uh, new report. Uh, it's actually more like a short book on the subject of U.S.-China technological decoupling. Uh, you'll notice that the word decoupling is in quotation marks in the title. I had to fight with our comms team about that, but it's that way for a reason, which I'll explain shortly. Um, I thought I'd start this talk by just giving some background on what I mean by decoupling and why I wrote this report. And then we'll launch into a uh, kind of three part structure for the talk itself before I take your questions, which I'm very much looking forward to. So first, what do I mean by technological decoupling? Uh, this is a somewhat uh, contested or fraught term. Um, some people, when they hear decoupling, they think of a binary on-off switch. Uh, we're either connected to China in the realm of technology or we're not. Um, so at points, uh, President Donald Trump, he once famously tweeted that a complete and total decoupling with China is on the table. So that's a kind of strong version of what people mean by decoupling, an actual divorce in terms of technology or the broader economic relationship. Uh, I'm using this term in its weaker form uh, to describe an ongoing partial and iterative reduction in U.S.-China technological interdependence. Um, now, of course, for decoupling to occur, there must first be coupling. And I think this audience is probably very familiar already with the many, many ways in which the U.S.-China technology ecosystem um, has kind of become um, deeply enmeshed over a series of decades. I sometimes like to describe them as two knotty masses that uh, help unite a larger global technological web, um, which could be understood as a technology supply chain or as a global technology marketplace, as the open global science and uh, engineering ecosystem. Um, there are many, many ways in which the U.S. and Chinese uh, technology bases and ecosystems are interdependent. Um, the fact that the U.S. relies on China as a manufacturing base, as a source of skilled labor, as a source of raw materials, the fact that China relies on the United States for uh, semiconductors, for market access, uh, the flow of money and people and data across the two countries. So all of that is included in what I'm describing as the technology relationship, which is now in uh, a phase of partial decoupling. Now, to be clear, even though I'm describing the United States and China as the key actors of concern to me, many, many actors are involved in this process. And this slide here illustrates the complexity of the uh, causal relationship. Uh, on the left side, you'll see the US government, the Chinese government, and third country governments. And on the right side, you'll see private sector actors, whether those are uh, commercial firms, universities, 
investors and others in all of these countries. And what this picture is attempting to show is the complex interdependent relationship amongst all of these actors. And I'll give you an example of this. Um, of course, many of you all will be familiar with uh, the US actions taken against TikTok. Uh, most famously, President Trump late in his administration issued several executive orders that would force a sale of TikTok um, and potentially ban TikTok from the United States on grounds of uh, Chinese access to US personal data and potential disinformation. Now, that was step one in then a multi-step process by which other actors then responded to that action. Um, so it was not long after that that China made its move against Didi, uh, the Chinese ride-hailing company, which was about to IPO in the United States. And at that time, China then stopped Didi from undergoing that IPO and initiated an onerous data security review. Now, there's many reasons why the Chinese government did that, but in all likelihood, one of those was to demonstrate to its own industry and to the world in the United States that it was willing to take reciprocal measures for the kinds of data security reviews that the United States wanted to do. That was step two. Then step three was the global reaction by other Chinese firms, by other private sector firms, and by the SEC and others that created a chilling effect in new Chinese IPs in the United States, IPOs in the United States. There really haven't been any since. And then step four was the reaction, the counter reaction by the US government when a number of members of the US Senate started calling for an acceleration of a law on the books called the Holding Foreign Companies Accountable Act, um, which will ultimately lead to a delisting of all Chinese companies from the US stock market unless China complies with US accounting transparency rules. So what I tried to encapsulate in that anecdote is the manner by which one action can lead to a feedback loop or echo of other decoupling actions. And what I call technological decoupling is actually an emergent process that results from the actions of all of these actors. That said, I will argue today that the US government is still and has been the prime mover in the recent wave of technological decoupling that began, let's say, five years ago. And much of my report is focused on US strategy and policy and how the US government should navigate this new era. Tech decoupling is very complicated. Uh, the reason why I wrote this report is not only because the policy stakes here are very, very high, and we'll discuss why that is, but also the discourse on these issues in the United States is, in my view, often um, simplistic and inadequate. And I'll briefly describe six reasons why that's the case. Uh, first is what I call the strategy policy gap. There are many people opining on how the United States should treat Chinese technology at a strategy level. Um, but many of those people may not walk the dog to specific policies. And then conversely, many people are writing 12, 15, 20 point policy agendas for US tech policy toward China. But many of those people aren't explaining the underlying strategic logic and dilemmas that are at stake. Uh, so that's one discourse problem. The second discourse problem is a divide between those that uh, deeply understand and think about uh, the national security problems here, um, potential Chinese subversion, uh, military advancement, espionage related to technology. And then on the other hand, those that understand the economic issues, um, whether that's the macroeconomics, the microeconomics, or things like um, WTO rules and OECD investment screening principles. Um, so that's a second problem in the discourse is merging those two communities. Uh, the third problem is the range of diverse technologies that are at issue and that are potentially being decoupled um, from 5G telecommunications equipment to semiconductor fabrication and design to drones, social media uh, companies, um, artificial intelligence software, large data caches, um, uh, you know, I, I could go on and on. And each of these technologies has a distinct um, geotechnological profile. Uh, they can't all be treated the same way. Um, and yet sometimes we get siloed, especially in um, complex industries like semiconductors and fail to see the bigger picture. Uh, 
The fourth policy discourse problem is the diversity of policy tools that are at issue. And we'll talk about those um, from export controls to investment screening to visa limits to law enforcement actions. Um, there are many policy tools at play and we need to understand how they all work in a holistic manner. A uh, fifth is the need for interdisciplinary expertise. Um, so my background really is in the nexus of technology and national security, but I also have a law degree, which helped me understand the regulatory picture. And I tried to understand as much as I could from China hands about uh, how Beijing thinks and acts. But even that is just the beginning of the many different expertises at stake um, from uh, technological innovation to public private partnerships to uh, tech diplomacy. Um, to, you know, uh, uh, futures prediction. Um, and finally, there are deeply challenging political and institutional constraints that shape the ability of the U.S. government to make clear and coherent strategy and policy in these areas. Uh, so if you think about each of these six discourse problems as inadequacies in the way that we currently talk about these issues, and each of them is a kind of dimensional space in which we need to fill uh, or bring together um, different communities, discourses, expertises. And so ultimately, you then define this huge six-dimensional space in which to say anything useful or credible on this topic, you really need to walk across this entire area. Um, that's why what began as a simple research project a couple years ago ballooned into a 160 plus page book um, that I'll then be gisting for you um, in the next 20 to 30 minutes. Um, so what I contribute in this paper is really three different things. Uh, first, I try to provide a primer that explains how we got here. Um, this is an intellectual primer on the history of US thinking over the last five to 10 years and a policy primer on the many, many different restrictive tools that the US government has been using to force and drive ongoing partial decoupling. Uh, the second thing that I try to do is offer a strategy analysis. What are the high level choices facing US decision makers? What are the big competing visions that US leaders must choose amongst as we move into this new era? And what would it actually mean to define a clear, coherent and sound strategy? Um, I try to analyze the space and offer my own argument as to the path that we should take. And then finally, once we have that strategy in hand, uh, the bulk of the report is a policy analysis, uh, trying to assess and ultimately recommend specific U.S. goals on specific uh, technology case studies in a range of different national security, economic and ancillary interest areas. Um, so with that being said, let's dive in, and that's going to be the structure of my talk today. Um, the primer, the strategy, and then the policy. So firstly, how has U.S. thinking and policy toward Chinese technology and our interdependence with China uh, evolved over the last 10 years? Uh, this is a slide, excuse me, to show how, how dramatically U.S. thinking on China as a whole beyond the technological realm has evolved in just 10 years time. I think we're all familiar with uh, the significant darkening of views in Washington toward China, but I think sometimes we forget how quickly this has happened. As recently as 2010, the official national security strategy of the United States said, we will continue to pursue a positive, constructive, and comprehensive relationship with China. Now, a lot happened after that, including um, the militarization of the South China Sea, um, the uh, deepening authoritarianism under President Xi, um, the encroachments of Hong Kong, um, of uh, Taiwan, um, the fact that, that China was not only continuing its intellectual property theft, but actually moving up the economic and technological value chain and uh, suggesting to the world that it had a uh, stronger global ambitions and uh, was um, uh, going to be more aggressive at home and abroad. Um, 2015 was probably the inflection point. That's when Secretary Carter started to use this phrase, a return to great power competition. Although what people forget is that that phrase was not overwhelmingly well received at the time. And actually the White House put out through anonymous sources that they really didn't like this phrase and that they wanted to um, remind everyone that nothing is preordained about this relationship. Uh, of course, we then see an intensification of rhetoric under the Trump administration. And now under Biden, 
uh, a more um, careful and I would say cryptic rhetoric, but ultimately still a definition of China, as we saw in Secretary Blinken's recent speech, as the greatest uh, long-term state challenge to the United States. So darkening views of China has been one factor in this shift toward decoupling, but that's not the other, the only factor. Uh, the other factor has been the ascension of techno-nationalist uh, viewpoints. And what I mean by techno-nationalism is the recognition that technology cannot simply be uh, left to the marketplace or be seen as um, a neutral um, economic competition, um, but it's instead something that will be a, a key arena for statecraft um, and that must be aligned with national strategy and protected from adversaries. And the United States was actually one of the last countries to come about um, to this ascending techno-nationalism, which in many parts of the world, including China, uh, was really sparked and catalyzed by U.S. dominance of um, uh, key technology industries. Uh, but ultimately, the U.S. realized that it, too, was vulnerable um, after an onslaught of cyber attacks, influence operations, intellectual property theft, and the recognition that countries like China um, were actually seeking and starting to lead and potentially dominate some of the key technologies of the future, such as 5G and artificial intelligence. So all of this gave birth to what I call a new U.S. techno-nationalism focused principally on China. And this is uh, played out in the policy arena in a variety of different ways. Um, this one slide uh, shows one of the most evocative statistics that I uncovered in my report, and that is the increased use of something called the entity list to target China. I'm sure many of you will have seen articles about the entity list. It's essentially a form of targeted export control that applies to a specific company, individual, or entity abroad uh, that essentially in its strong form bans that company from importing any U.S. origin good uh, without a license from the Commerce Department. Um, so this can be a very significant restriction depending on how it's implemented. Um, as recently as four years ago, uh, China was a relatively small portion of the entity list, although a substantial portion. And you'll see what happened over just four years time if you look at the right-hand slide of, hand of the slide. The number of China-based entities on the entity list um, I counted a quadrupling in four years period. Um, and of course, the entity list as a whole has grown, um, but China has accounted for, um, uh, I believe, half of that growth, if, if I'm remembering the statistics properly. So the entity list is one quantifiable way in which the U.S. government has turned to a series of what I call restrictive or defensive tools to essentially force certain forms of decoupling with China in the technological arena or thwart techno uh, Chinese technological advancement or influence in some way. But the entity list is far from the only tool that we've used. Um, actually, there's a large and growing toolkit of technology restrictions. And uh, what I will just paint a short picture of um, across a variety of different arenas is how in many different policy areas, um, the previously extant tools have been both strengthened and drastically intensified uh, in their application toward China in a roughly five-year period. Um, so export controls, we've already talked about the entity list, um, but there have been a number of other innovations like the use of something called the foreign direct product rule to create unique restrictions on Huawei's ability to acquire semiconductors and other advanced technologies. Um, beyond export controls, you could look at investment restrictions. Uh, famously, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States uh, reviews and can block foreigners from acquiring sensitive U.S. companies. And in a roughly five-year period, CFIUS activity has greatly increased, its jurisdiction has expanded, and there have been a number of high-profile blocking of Chinese companies buying U.S. tech companies, um, including most famously uh, Grindr, the dating app. Um, there have also been uh, the beginnings of an outbound investment restriction regime, something called the non-SDN CMIC list, which is an acronym of acronyms, something only U.S. government bureaucrats could love. 
um, prevents U.S. Uh, Americans um, from uh, investing in about 70 Chinese companies, including leading Chinese tech companies that have been involved in human rights abuses and other concerns. And there's discussion now of an even broader uh, outbound investment screening process that could be imposed either by Congress or the administration. Uh, the third area is uh, telecommunications licensing and equipment authorizations. This is the Federal Communications Commission, and uh, they have done a lot to essentially revoke or deny the ability of Chinese companies to operate telecoms carriers in the United States or build undersea cables linking to the United States. And most drastically, a new law will prevent a series of listed Chinese companies from selling any new radio frequency equipment, that is electronics that have radio frequency emissions in the United States. But this is the first time that such authorizations have ever been withheld on national security grounds. Up until now, it's always been a technically based decision. So I can't go through all of this. We just don't even have the time. But uh, to paint a broad picture, um, visa bans have been instituted on Chinese graduate students and researchers that have certain affiliations with Chinese universities that have themselves been involved in so-called military civil fusion. Um, import restrictions have been placed in the form of uh, tariffs um, and uh, also the uh, potential exclusion of uh, Chinese uh, products like DJI drones or high terra radios um, that uh, may um, uh, violate U.S. intellectual property. Uh, financial sanctions have been imposed on a small number of Chinese officials involved in human rights abuses and corruption. Um, so far, this has largely not touched tech companies, but there is discussion right now that the uh, silver bullet of U.S. unilateral financial sanctions, the SDN list, could be used against Hike Vision, a major Chinese global manufacturer of surveillance and camera equipment. Um, which would be an unprecedented use of this authority. Um, we've discussed the app bans on TikTok and WeChat and others, which were later rescinded. Um, there's also been something called the ICTS um, uh, supply chain security rule, um, which is a, a sweeping kind of CFIUS for technology transactions that has actually empowered the Commerce Department to review and potentially block any large scale use of Chinese technology in the United States. It has not yet been implemented, but this could be one of the most important authorities over time. Uh, we could go on, but I'll just briefly end by describing, of course, the China Initiative. I think this is of concern to the lab and to the academic community. Um, it's now been ended, uh, but it will live on in, uh, on, in another form and in other branding. Um, so uh, this has been an extraordinary array of policy innovation, which is only continuing. It was very difficult to write this section of the report because literally not a week goes by that there is not a new press leak or a proposal in the Federal Register of some new policy innovation, some new addition to some kind of restrictive list. Um, uh, I'll just I'll, I'll use this slide to um, show you the, the breadth of leading Chinese companies across so many different sectors. Um, telecommunications, surveillance, e-commerce, um, uh, drones, uh, social media, uh, productivity software, artificial intelligence, facial recognition, semiconductors. Uh, on the x-axis shows you how many of China's leaders in each of these sectors and more have been placed on a large number of restrictive lists of the kind that I've just described. Um, what I think this chart also shows is how ad hoc some of these actions have been. Um, and that's really the key strategic problem for the United States, that these have been a smattering often of um, uh, tactical company specific actions that aren't always uh, offered with an, an articulable principle, um, uh, whether it's a, a limiting principle or a justification that can help us understand where this is all going. Um, ultimately, U.S. policy tools are very fragmented and complex, and the U.S. administration has vast discretion to do far more than it's done to date. Um, most of these tools have been used to a tiny fraction of their full potential, and the president really has legal authority to create a decoupling of his choosing.
Uh, that means that a very clear strategy is needed to prevent incoherence. And most of all, what I worry is overreach. So with that said, I want to then pivot to the strategy problem. What would it then look like to have a coherent, um, clear, sound, predictable strategy to guide the use of these restrictive tools? Um, the U.S. government does not have a strategy like that to date. Uh, we've seen a variety of statements from a variety of U.S. government officials, um, but they've been all over the map, and they really have not spoken to the major dilemmas, trade-offs, and questions that many of us have about where all of this is going. Uh, how much do we want to decouple? Um, in what areas? With what technologies? With what tools? And maybe the most provocative question that one can ask in Washington today is, where does it all stop? What is the nature of a technology relationship that we actually do want to have with China in the future? And what would be gained and lost along the way in any of these different visions? What I try to do in my report is define um, three different groupings or camps of strategists and proposals that you'll find in the policy and strategy community. Um, on the one hand is what I call restrictionists. Restrictionists are those that tend to take the harshest view and that want to um, do the most to uh, pull up the drawbridge and drastically increase technology restrictions targeting China. Um, so these are people like Matthew Pottinger from the Trump administration, uh, Senator Tom Cotton on Capitol Hill, um, Derek Scissors at AEI and the U.S.-China um, uh, Security and Economic Review Commission. So these are people like uh, China hawks. Um, but also um, institutions like Human Rights Watch um, and others that are concerned about the human rights situation in China, um, and many national security officials, um, particularly in the military and intelligence community. Uh, my former boss, General Joe Dunford, has seemed to have some restrictionist leanings. Uh, the common belief, if I could name one, and this is, of course, a very crude set of characterizations and groupings, is the belief among restrictionists that the U.S.-China technology relationship is zero-sum and tends to advantage China. So you'll encounter arguments such as China is gaining long-term strategic advantage by acquiring intellectual property and hollowing out and displacing U.S. industries. And in return, all the United States is gaining is this kind of ephemeral access to cheap products and replaceable labor, um, but ultimately uh, we will be replaced in the leading technology um, uh, uh, industries of the future. Uh, what many tech restrictionists believe is that there is a short window of opportunity uh, to prevent Chinese techno-driven dominance. Um, and so you'll hear proposals like Pottinger says, um, you know, we need to increase by a factor of 10 our outbound investment screenings, for example. Um, or Tom Cotton wants to, you know, at the extreme end, you know, revoke permanent normal trade relations um, or issue sanctions on Chinese national champions and essentially um, kill them, destroy them. You know, sometimes you will hear from the hawkish camp this argument that we need to actually kill and destroy companies like Huawei or Hikvision, um, which may or may not be within our power. So that's at one extreme. Now, at the other extreme is what I call cooperationists. Um, this is kind of the ancien regime. This is the formerly dominant view within Washington. Um, the belief that an open uh, technological cooperation with China, uh, an open ecosystem of a free flow of capital, goods, data, um, is beneficial to us, that we are well positioned to lead, and that the globe benefits from non-zero-sum technological engagement. Um, so, of course, cooperationists would include the business community. Um, I point to entities like the Semiconductor Industry Association, uh, companies like Google that have advocated against, um, you know, placing of Huawei on the entity list, arguing that this could have unintended consequences for cybersecurity, uh, because Huawei, of course, um, shifted away from the Android operating system and instead started to use its own less secure operating system. Uh, there's also um, the early pioneers of the internet, um, people like um, Vince Cerf, uh, organizations like the World Wide Web Foundation or the Internet Society that have put out strong statements, often co-signed by, you know, the Twitters, Amazons, Facebooks of the world that have said that um, 
the internet should not be geopolitically divided. Uh, that politicians and national leaders should not be carving up aspects of the technology stack. There are also progressives in Washington, folks like Senator Bernie Sanders, who are worried about the tendency to inflate China threats of all types and to securitize our own economy and politics based on that inflated threat perception. Uh, many progressives worry, of course, about the need to globally cooperate with China on issues like climate and public health. And this may involve intensification of technological cooperation with China, not creating walls. So cooperationists uh, worry about new technology restrictions. They tend to believe that these um, harm our own innovation ecosystem and that they're internationally destabilizing. Now, let me say that the cooperationist camp has um, greatly diminished in influence since the Obama administration. And I would argue it's not a major factor in the Washington debate today. Um, instead, the debate is primarily between those restrictionists that I discussed before and a middle camp that I call the centrists. Uh, the centrists, and maybe you might hear in my tone here, I identify as a centrist. Um, the centrists take what I believe is a more complex view of the relationship. Um, they take what I believe is kind of the best insights from both of these other camps. Uh, centrists tend to believe that the U.S.-China tech relationship has some zero-sum elements, but also some non-zero-sum elements, and that there are mixed costs and benefits for both sides of the equation, and that there's a lot of uncertainty and unpredictability as to how this will play out over time. Um, a lot of mainstream think tank analysts, um, you know, folks who are the kind of technocrats around town like me, uh, tend to be in the centrist camp. Um, these are the people who will use phrases like small yard with a high fence meaning that technology restrictions should be the exception and not the rule. We should focus those restrictive or defensive measures on a small number of the most sensitive strategic and critical technologies and do what we can to protect those, but otherwise allow a continued flow of data, people, money, and products um, in the, the mine run, the, 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 the main of the U.S.-China tech relationship should be primarily preserved and we should have some kind of semi-globalized tech marketplace, but with select carve-outs. Um, you'll see folks like Senator Chris Coons identify with this and also outside of the DC bubble, uh, many state and local leaders who have more of a practical and concrete stake in the US-China economic relationship. Um, polling and interviews that Carnegie has conducted suggest centrist leanings outside of the Beltway. Uh, Centrists basically have, I would argue, three ideas. Um, one is that we need to have narrowly targeted restrictive measures. Two is that these restrictive measures need to uh, be multilateral, that they need to be carefully aligned with our allies and partners in order to be um, effective and in order to not disadvantage the United States and global marketplaces. And thirdly, and this is crucially important, Centrists argue that these defensive measures like sanctions, visa bans, export controls, investment screening must not distract from the core, what's sometimes called offensive agenda of so-called um, running faster, self-improvement, self-investment, uh, things that the United States actually needs to do to invest in its own technological strength. Uh, resilience um, and security at home, uh, irrespective of uh, threats from China. Um, let me argue as to why one should be a centrist with the caveat that it's very difficult to argue in this strategic space because most people come to this with basically a set of priors, a set of intellectual presuppositions, which are kind of non-falsifiable. Um, so restrictionists, for example, have a point of view about the future direction of the Chinese state, um, its future intentions and future capabilities. Uh, cooperationists often have a different point of view. Um, there are also arguments about U.S. domestic priorities and what kind of technology ecosystem will actually be the most innovative and competitive in the 21st century with new types of technology and economic relationships and public private dynamics things that you know in my opinion are, are kind of unknowable and kind of non-falsifiable so just a caveat it's very difficult to convince someone in one of these camps to shift to another camp 
But I, I make a modest effort to do that in this report on two grounds. Uh, my essential argument is that we're living in a very complex and uncertain geotechnological moment. Uh, new technologies like 5G, uh, machine learning, quantum computing are coming online. And it's not possible today to really predict how these technologies will influence military balances, um, diplomatic alignments, and also what course and direction the US-China relationship will take. I, I do still see a lot of flux and um, questions about the course of movement here. So I'm somewhat agnostic as to how deeply we should plan to decouple. Um, do we want a hard, full, complete decoupling at some point, or should we retain as much as possible of uh, today's semi-globalized tech marketplace? What that then means is one should consider a hedging strategy that's compatible with a variety of different scenarios. Um, and I define this hedging strategy in two ways. Firstly, we need to focus on those offensive investments. We need to bolster federal R&D spending. We need to do the reshoring of the semiconductor fabrication ecosystem. Um, we need to uh, pass new legislation to shore up our own cybersecurity. Um, we need to restore trust and faith in our political information ecosystem in the digital and non-digital arena. These are huge challenges that are really the ultimate challenges in combating Chinese tech threats. Um, but these are things that we need to do ourselves domestically over a period of likely years, um, if not a decade or more. Uh, for that to work, we need to buy time. And so if the primary effort is running faster or so-called offense, then the secondary supporting effort is a set of defensive restrictions that can be used to forestall Chinese advancement or influence in areas where China or Chinese companies potentially are verging on some kind of breakthrough that could create a position of enduring dominance over time. Uh, the classic example being 5G telecommunications equipment. There really was this moment, um, which is somewhat still with us um, several years ago, where it looked like China could run away with access to the strategic cyber terrain of the coming decade. And so we threw the book at Huawei and ZTE and it was partially effective. So that was a great example of a closing window of opportunity where we employed defensive tools to try to buy time for ourselves. And one of the things that we did then was create runway for um, open architectures like ORAN and for European competitors like Nokia and Ericsson um, to uh, create space for themselves in this 5G marketplace. Uh, but still, my argument is that we must be very selective in using these tools because they come with significant costs and risks. And my primary concern is this feedback loop that I described at the very beginning of this talk, that one set of restrictions creates expectations of more restrictions, especially when we find it so difficult to articulate clear limiting principles and stopping points that are persuasive to Beijing and to the global private sector. Once these expectations for a further intensification of decoupling set in, various runaway dynamics can come into place where private or governmental actors around the world seek to self-protect, seek to preempt the next technology restriction and basically set in motion a self-fulfilling prophecy. Now, the restrictionists might cheer this, but from my point of view, it's crucial for the United States to maintain control of the decoupling process so that we can set the pace and course and can define how quickly it happens in which areas that we believe to be sensitive and critical. Because frankly, we're not ready in a lot of different areas. An example of this would be drones. China is by far and away the global market leader in commercial drones, DJI. Um, DJI sells 80% of the drones bought by American companies, um, American law enforcement agencies, American state and local government agencies. If we were to preemptively cut ourselves off from Chinese drones, uh, we would really halt deployment of one of the key technologies of the coming decade. Um, I don't think we can afford to do that. I think we need to develop our own cost and technology competitive drone industry. But until we do that, we can't afford to ban DJI drones. So that's just one example of how we need to buy time 
and maintain control of the decoupling process. And I believe a centrist strategy of careful and carefully messaged narrow defensive tools to buy time for offensive investments can essentially help us hedge. If we decide in the future that we need a much more sweeping decoupling than we're capable of doing today, then this strategy will prepare us to do so at lower cost and risk. If on the other hand, and I think we can hope that by some uh, set of developments, it remains possible to have a constructive economic and technological relationship with China, then all of these investments will increase U.S. competitiveness, resilience, innovative capacity, um, and maintain the possibility of that kind of constructive relationship in the future. So that's the strategy discussion. Uh, where I want to end is what it would then mean to translate this strategy into specific U.S. government policy and process. And as a former U.S. government official myself, I'm very conscious of the issue of laying out these sweeping ideas and not actually doing the work of describing how the Commerce Department, the State Department, the Defense Department could actually implement agency or interagency processes um, to make these into reality. So the bulk of my report, which unfortunately I don't have time to go through in its entirety, is a set of step-by-step -step, um, analyses of translating this centrist strategy into policy into specific areas. And the first thing that I argue that we need to do is actually define the U.S. interests and objectives at stake. Instead of using this very hazy language of China tech threats or countering China tech or even decoupling, these really aren't specific enough. It's often this kind of agglomeration of many different ideas that are running together that need to be distinguished and understood separately. So the first step that I do is define nine different policy objectives. Maintaining a military edge over China. Limiting China's national security espionage. Preventing Chinese sabotage in a crisis. Limiting Chinese influence operations. Combating Chinese authoritarianism and repression using technology. And then those are the national security objectives. I also describe economic objectives. Firstly, countering unfair Chinese economic practices, including, but not limited to, IP theft. And also competing and leading in strategic industries. Um, note that those two things are not the same thing. Fairness and winning are actually distinct objectives, and to some extent they can uh, be disaligned. And then finally, I described two ancillary objectives, um, policy goals where U.S. leaders are often not entirely seeking to manipulate tech policy per se, but are using tech policy for some other reason, whether that's to obtain general leverage over China or to shape U.S. domestic narratives and politics. So step one is defining all of these interest areas. Then let me just describe for you and give one or two examples of the methodology that I use to then do an assessment of each of these areas. And I have a chapter on all nine of these areas. Uh, what you'll see in this chart is I take each row is, you know, one of the national security objectives. And I basically describe for each objective um, a proposed standard for government tech controls, when to use it and when not to use it. And the chapter is, in essence, a, uh, an attempt at a detailed cost-benefit analysis of, on the one hand, the risks of technological interdependence with China, and on the other hand, the risks of decoupling and the limits of a defensive, defensive tools like sanctions. Um, so in the, uh, in the case of uh, Chinese national security espionage, I devote a lot of ink to this issue of China's access to U.S. personal data, which they might be able to use to uh, target and exploit U.S. officials with access to classified information. Um, ultimately, I describe the need for sharper U.S. analysis of specific types of data, not just all personal data, which is often how we talk about these things, um, but specific categories of data that China cannot otherwise readily obtain and whose loss would be hard to remedy. Um, so I walk through some case studies of different categories of data that, in my view, would fall on either side of that line. So, for example, uh, CFIUS has taken to blocking Chinese purchase of 
uh, American companies with large amounts of genetic information. That makes eminent sense to me because genetic information has tremendous intelligence value. It can be used to identify and physically surveil or profile U.S. officials. Um, it has lifelong, decades-long consequences. It's nearly impossible to remedy breach of that information. And it's not necessarily clear that China can readily obtain this information other than through the purchase um, of companies such as 23andMe. Um, but so I think it makes eminent sense to uh, block China's uh, access to that information. I contrast that with another category of information, geolocation data. Now, CFIUS also uh, places special scrutiny on Chinese purchase of companies with um, access to large amounts of uh, geolocation data on Americans. The fact is geolocation data on Americans is ubiquitously available and virtually unregulated. The U.S. military and the intelligence community reportedly are themselves conducting bulk purchases of this data to conduct um, intelligence and military targeting around the world. There, there's no doubt that China is already doing the, the same thing. So asking CFIUS to prevent this by blocking the sale of U.S. apps um, is kind of like putting your finger in the dike. It really accomplishes very little other than um, impeding capital formation in an important part of the U.S. economy. Um, so the final part of each chapter then is a discussion of those key offensive measures to remind U.S. policymakers that it's not just about defense. It's not just about these restrictive tools. If we're really worried about Chinese national security espionage, um, we don't need to just do China specific things. We need to strengthen ourselves by, for example, passing national cybersecurity and data privacy laws and improving the capacity and capability of defensive counterintelligence available to US government officials. Um, so I'm pretty much at 45 minutes. So I'm just gonna wrap up um, by just kind of, you know, just showing you kind of visually that uh, I have a chapter on each one of these nine interest areas and I do the same methodology for each. So I'm happy to take questions about any of these areas and to talk about a number of different technologies from social media to 5G um, to whatever else that's on your mind. Uh, the final thought that I'll leave you with is the following question. What technology relationship does the United States actually want to have with China? Uh, I think the policy community in the last five years has gotten much sharper at and better at describing and defining the risks of technological interdependence with China and the many ways that that interdependence can harm U.S. national security and economic security or other interests. What we still have not, I think, gotten good at talking about is the risks of decoupling and the complexities, the second and the third order consequences that may be unintended if we try to push this farther, faster, or in a messier and less coherent way than we should. Um, ultimately, if we're not headed toward a Cold War style economic and diplomatic divorce from China, which I think is totally non-viable in today's world, then we need to have an answer to the question of the nature and character of the technology relationship we do want to have with China. Uh, U.S. leaders still are unwilling to talk in those terms. Um, and so I hope that my report can start a conversation um, by, in essence, being um, an example of uh, what it would look like to describe such a vision uh, at a strategy level and at a policy level and hold it up for scrutiny. Um, and I, of course, welcome critiques, um, debates, and counter arguments. Um, and I then ask those on the restrictionist side or the cooperationist side um, to hold up their vision uh, for scrutiny and, and, and be clear about what it is that they're driving at um, so that we can have a fulsome debate on what I believe is um, one of the uh, defining issues of our time in tech policy, in China policy, and in global affairs more broadly. Thank you. Thank you, John. That was very, very informative.